Greetings and welcome to Unit 3. In this video, we are going to walk through the primary projects for this class, the worship observations and worship designs. We will specifically cover grading rubrics associated with these projects so you understand what is expected. Additionally, you will find a second video for Unit 3 that provides a sample worship order that I have created. In the second half of Unit 3, Video 2, I will provide examples of how the foundations for worship leadership can be integrated into a rigorous mechanism for observing worship. Now, let's take a closer look at the primary projects associated with this course. The worship observations and designs are specifically designed to help students grow in their leadership capacity. Please review the specific sections of the syllabus that provide minimum requirements for the worship observations and designs, including the minimum word count expectation. Grading rubrics provided in Blackboard will provide a more specific framework for creating your observations and designs. But before we examine the rubrics associated with the worship observations and designs, I want to remind you of the five foundations of worship leadership introduced in Unit 1. You might find it helpful to go ahead and memorize these foundations. Biblical, theological, historical, cultural considerations, and aesthetic considerations. Our hope is that you journey for a lifetime in these critical areas. For example, your worship leadership capacity will grow by simply noticing how consistently the theme of worship appears throughout Scripture. Furthermore, your depth in these five areas will be directly related to your effectiveness as a worship leader. Keep in mind that for those of you who are currently playing the lead pastor role or for those who plan to do so in the future, your depth in these five areas will be critical for equipping the ministry team at your church toward engaging in biblically sound, relevant worship leadership. Of course, as noted at the end of Article 2 provided in Unit 1, all of these efforts must be bathed in prayer. One could be steep in these five areas or even have a team that is well equipped in the five foundations. But without prayer, we will find that our attempts at worship leadership excellence fall flat. In fact, we must recognize that when God blesses our corporate worship experiences in spite of lackluster prayer, this is because of his grace and consistent love for the church. But we may be missing something in our gatherings that could only be explained as God's direct intervention in our mundane meetings when we are not consistently praying that his kingdom might come into our corporate worship engagement. The biblical and theological foundations began to be explored in Unit 1 materials, but Dr. Johnson engaged our curiosity in these foundational areas in earnest in Unit 2. You will continue to see various materials and lectures related to these key areas throughout the rest of the semester. But again, let me emphasize that our ultimate goal is that you develop research techniques that allow you to develop a sound biblical theology of worship. One of the documents created for the midterm review, which you observed in Unit 2, begins to unpack worship history and basic frameworks in worship observation, namely Etic and Emic. The introduction to history midterm review also includes explanations that directly relate to the grading rubric for the designs. Because of the close connection between the introduction to history review provided in Chapter 2, you might find it beneficial to pause the video at this point and read that document before continuing this video, if you have not already done so. Let's go to th these rubrics now to make sure everyone knows what is expected on observation and design assignments. Before we look at the rubric associated with the aesthetic observation, let me just offer a quick word related to the worship assessment criteria. Now, this is the one project where you do not have a grading rubric, and that's actually purposeful. First of all, I can think of perhaps no instance in the history of this class where someone has turned in the worship assessment criteria at the minimum required length on time in which the person made anything less than an A. So first of all, let me say to you, do not worry about your grade on the worship assessment criteria. The main purpose 
of this initial project, the worship assessment criteria, is to get you ready to go out to the churches to do worship observations, or for those of you who will need to do your observations by video to prepare you to watch that video and make a thorough observation. Now, within your worship assessment criteria, think in taxonomic structures. If you'd like to borrow the taxonomic structure that I've offered to you, reminding you of our five foundations of worship leadership, biblical, theological, historical, cultural considerations, aesthetic considerations, that's fine. You could use that as your taxonomic framework. But I've seen students create other taxonomic frameworks. The main point is that you've created some categories in which to place a range of questions that would relate to worship. For example, someone might create a two-part taxonomy in which they have questions for everything in the service that occurs up to the preaching, and then everything that occurs from the preaching to the end of the service, which may or may not include an invitation. In that case, you've really got a two-part taxonomy that's based on the time frame of the worship service. I'm offering this simple example only to say there's a, there are a lot of ways that you could structure your worship assessment criteria. I hope that you'll actually spend some time reflecting on this, but if you land on one of these two basic frameworks that I've offered you, either the conceptual foundations as your framework for questions, which come out of the five foundations for worship leadership, or a time frame like the example I just offered uh, with what's happening from the beginning of the service up until the preaching and the preaching to the end of the service, that's fine. But come up with some framework for your questions and then fill in those overall categories with a range of specific questions related to worship leadership. Now let's look at our grading rubric for the aesthetic observation. So when you click on the aesthetic observation assignment, you'll come to a page uh, that looks like the screen you're observing right now. And, and here where you see grading rubric, aesthetic observation, you will simply click on that item and your rubric will open up. So we're going to walk you through this rubric. Let me go ahead and note for you that the rubric for the kinesthetic observation is the same as the aesthetic observation. So once we've walked through this rubric, you'll be in good shape for your kinesthetic observation as well. This first category, objectivity, very much relates to a concept that was presented in your Unit 2 Introduction to History Midterm Review. So within that midterm review material, I referred to an emic and etic perspective. You might recall the anecdote that I offered related to having an etic, that is a cultural outsider's perspective, on Cuban coffee. Although my dad grew up in Miami and I've been to Miami several times in my life, I would not consider myself a cultural insider on Cuban coffee. I have had the great opportunity to drink Cuban coffee, both in Miami and at my home in New Orleans. I've had Cuban friends come over to our house and teach us how to make Cuban coffee, but I still have a cultural outsider's perspective. One only begins to move toward a cultural insider after years of engaging culture, which is an important concept not only for worship leadership, but also for evangelism in rural sections of our country and in our cities. If one hopes to reach people in a great city like Chicago, one has to spend a great deal of time in Chicago in the neighborhoods which one hopes to reach to really begin to understand what's going on cultural and culturally and to know how to engage people with the gospel. The case is the same for one who hopes uh, to reach a community on the West Coast. It's going to take time to understand the culture there and to know how to engage with those folks with a gospel-centered uh, worship model. Now, how does emic and etic relate to objectivity? Again, the etic perspective is the cultural outsider. The emic perspective is the cultural insider. 
Uh, when we talk about emic perspective, well, that reminds me of uh, really my childhood. Uh, I have lots of cultural connections to Deep South worship uh, with family in Mississippi and Alabama. Although I'm from New Orleans at the age of nine, uh, my dad, who is a pastor and graduate of New Orleans Baptist Seminary, uh, moved our family to Jones County, Mississippi. And uh, I had lots of experiences with Deep South robust hymn singing uh, in Jones County. So I have a cultural insiders. I have a cultural emic perspective uh, when it comes to observing Deep South hymn singing. When I'm going to observe services, so for the aesthetic observation, for example, uh, when I go out to a Greek Orthodox Church, that would be a great place to go observe uh, aesthetic worship. Or if you uh, are not able to go out and view in person, you might observe a Catholic service online, another uh, great service to observe for the aesthetic observation, or, or an Episcopal service. These are going to tend to be highly liturgical services. So when you go out and uh, observe these services, these aesthetic services, we want to encourage you to be objective. We're recognizing that for most of you, unless you just happen to grow up in a highly liturgical setting, that your perspective is probably more etic. It's probably more of a cultural outsider. And there's going to most likely be some things in the service that you, dis that you disagree with doctrinally. Uh, it's fine to observe those things and to include those in your observation, but don't let your observation turn in to simply a repudiation of, of what you're observing in the service. Rather, uh, reveal to us some things that you can learn from this service, uh, perhaps some aspects of beauty that you observe in this service that might help you in your own worship designs, and more importantly, to help you grow as a worship leader uh, for the rest of your days of ministry. The top category for objectivity says... Uh, students, the student recognizes personal bias and overcomes it. He or she always identifies assumptions. So again, simply work within that framework, seeking to be objective as you observe the services. Now let's move on to our next category, use of evidence. If you go to observe uh, an Episcopal service, they might provide for you a, an order of worship. Uh, that includes the liturgical uh, details for that particular service, or they might have the liturgy provided online. The evidence could also include just simply what you observe that day. Now, again, you're going to have your worship assessment criteria in place before you do your observation. Some students are comfortable filling out their worship assessment criteria as they're observing, but you might be in a setting where that uh, seems to be a little awkward to actually be making notes as the worship is occurring. So if you just engage in the worship service, which would be a great thing to do, I would highly encourage that if that's possible, to go to a live setting and engage in the service. But I would encourage you, if you're able to do that, which would be ideal, to, to go home that day, certainly before you go to bed that day, and make some notes about what you observed, simply because you'll forget what you've observed. And so you're, you're creating or you're communicating a sense that you've been thorough uh, in your review of the evidence. Uh, student accurate, accurately and thoroughly examines evidence and sources. It's a, the assessment of evidence is insightful and comprehensive. Now our next category is really related to graduate writing for any class you might take. So this is just a general encouragement. We want all of our students to grow in their ability in regard to valid argumentation. So notice what the highest score says. Always draws valid or reasonable conclusions from the premises. Evidence is cogent thinking. So this is just good, rigorous, valid argumentation that you certainly would, would want to uh, to be a part of your communication, whether you're proclaiming the Word of God or whether you're sharing the gospel. Organization, exceptionally clear and directive focus, connects ideas with exceptional clarity. 
So there's just a logical flow to how the ideas in your observation are communicated. I'm sure this will not be a problem uh, for you as you create your worship observation. And then finally, uh, in this category, notice only counts 10%. But we do uh, encourage you to review what you've written, to have clean, clear, concise writing that evidences fewer than four grammatical communication errors. Fewer than four grammatical and or communication errors. Now, we're going to go back and look at our aesthetic design. Again, you'll simply click on the aesthetic design and click on aesthetic worship design for the rubric to come up. I'm going to only walk specifically through the aesthetic worship design as the rubrics for the three designs, although not identical, are very similar. Now, let me just make a couple of notes about the designs and, and what this paper is going to look like. At the top of the paper, on the first page, uh, well, after your title page, you'll have uh, your liturgy. And so th those will just be the details in your liturgy. You can have some generic references like invocational prayer, but many of the items will be specific. So you could put something like call to worship, but if you intend for that to be a song, list the specific song. So you'll have the specific worship items, which will include several song titles. You'll have, I would assume you'd have at least one scripture reference, either, either in association with the, with the preaching uh, that day, uh, the sermon that day, or you might have more than one scripture reference if you want to have a scripture reading in, the, in addition to the text for the sermon. So you'll have the specific details, but you're not going to explain these items. Uh, the word count is filled out, when you get into a paragraph explanation of why you're doing what you're doing. Now, I want to encourage you to recognize that you can be more creative with this aesthetic design than you might think at first glance. As you go to the Holy Gatherings textbook and you uh, observe what Drs. Sharp and Smith explain, and related to, uh, explain related to aesthetic worship, uh, you, you might get the sense that they're talking about a highly liturgical setting, and that would not be wrong. And so what some students have done through the years is when they turn in their aesthetic design, uh, we get the clear view of an aesthetic worship service that is very traditional. Robes, uh, stained glass windows, uh, very strict liturgy, and that's fine. Uh, some might see that as the safest way uh, to produce an aesthetic worship design. You're welcome to do that. But if you'd like to be more creative, let's say uh, you dream of being in an urban setting one day and uh, doing church planning or replanning in an urban setting, or perhaps that's where you are now, and you'd like to create a design for an aesthetic design for that setting. By all means, we want to encourage you to be creative with this if you wish. What I would do if you're going to go that route is in the first paragraph, I would explain that you understand what the aesthetic worship design is about. You might even have a, a reference uh, to the Holy Gatherings textbook. Uh, you, by the way, you're not actually required to use footnotes in the designs, but if you wanted to reference the Holy Gatherings book, uh, it's never a bad idea to have a, uh, a, a good an accurate uh, footnote, so you could do that there. And then you would explain that for your aesthetic design, uh, in this case, you're in an urban setting. So you're going to have some creative elements related to that urban setting. Now, what are some things you could do in an urban setting? I've actually seen a church here in New Orleans uh, that, had, uh, that was a church plant in our city that on the walls had pictures of the city. Uh, I'm recalling a picture of uh, a gentleman playing a trumpet, a very clear New Orleans scene. 
So instead of stained glass in this church, you had these pictures of the culture of the city. So you could use pictures as your replacement for stained glass. Or you might refer to some aspect of the beauty of the PowerPoints uh, as an aesthetic element. Uh, some have referred to PowerPoints and what we can do with uh, PowerPoint backgrounds. Uh, and of course, many of you are going to be using uh, things like ProPresenter that are going to give you an, a range of backgrounds that you can use. And, and some have said this is our new stained glass. So it's perfectly fine, perfectly fine to make those sort of references on an aesthetic design. You could use contemporary music if you'd like to. Again, I would just say that in the opening paragraph. Now, I know some of you who have already read your Spectrum's textbook are saying, now, wait a second, if you're saying we can put contemporary worship in a liturgical design, that sounds a lot like Weber's definition of blended worship. And you would be right if you're thinking that. So let me just say, uh, before we get much further, that although we very much appreciate Weber's perspective on blended worship, uh, you're going to hear Weber's name come up throughout the course, uh, not just in the textbook on spectrums. Very influential thinker on worship in the 20th century. Um, I would say that most of us, including myself, would probably not agree with Weber as to what blended worship actually is. I still tend to think of blended worship and still hear people use that descriptor for worship that combines both new music and old music. So it's perfectly fine when you go to do your worship design. In that case, by the way, if you're going to use my definition of blended worship, mixing old and new music, you probably should say in the first paragraph that you recognize and understand Weber's definition as, as, uh, as explained in the Spectrum's textbook. But for, the, for, but for your design, you're going to use this more basic definition of combining new and old. You don't have to reference me on that. You can, but the, the grader for that project will understand what you're talking about. Now, back to our aesthetic design. Uh, if, if you haven't caught what I'm saying thus far, I am absolutely encouraging you to be creative. Please, by all means, be creative on this if you wish. If you want to take that, quote, safe route, of having a very liturgical, traditional service that in many ways can be traced all the way back uh, to First Baptist Charleston um, in the history of the Southern Baptist Convention, uh, that more liturgical model. That's, that's a part of who we are as Baptists. It's, it's experiencing a great renaissance right now in the 21st century. We have churches here in New Orleans that are doing a pretty liturgical uh, service on Sunday morning and taking communion every week. Uh, perfectly fine to do that. In fact, let me let me say this about the worship aesthetic uh, design. Uh, I would encourage you, regardless of whether you use one of these creative ideas and use new music or whether you go the traditional route, I would encourage you to put the Lord's Supper in this service because of all the designs, one would almost assume that communion would be an aesthetic design. And if one is consistently doing an aesthetic design, we're 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 usually assuming that they're doing the Lord's Supper more frequently than, than the quarterly approach, which is what I remember growing up. So many churches now are doing Lord's Supper at least once a month, if not weekly. Uh, and so, yes, that, that, that is a thing that is happening in Baptist churches these days. All right, now let's look at our specific categories for the aesthetic worship design. Uh, in addition to demonstrating competency in one's understanding of aesthetic models as expounded in the textbook and lectures slash post, the student integrates that understanding with historical references to outstanding worship practices. That is, at least three historical references must be made to attain 100%. Now, I'm hoping that you're recognizing uh, that the lights are going off in your head that, oh, okay, this connects to some of the earlier information uh, that we were introduced to in Unit 2, the introduction to the history of worship. Yes, absolutely. And if you wanted to skip ahead 
and look at some later units where we go deeper into the history of worship with, with some lectures that are presented in those units, that's fine to go ahead and look at some of that. But really, you would have enough information just with the midterm review in Unit 2 to have at least three uh, clear, substantial historical references. Now, how much do you need to say for there to be a historical reference? Really, one sentence would get it done. Uh, in some instances, you might need more than one sentence to have a clear reference. But even one sentence would be enough to have three historical references. Now, let me say uh, that I should probably clarify what is not a historical reference. The first category would be pretty obvious. You can't simply say, uh, we're doing what a friend we have in Jesus because this is grandma's favorite hymn. Now, technically, that would be history because if your grandmother lived in the 1940s or 50s, that, that's, that's history. Um, but we need for you to put a little more rigorous academic thought into it uh, than to simply refer to grandma's favorite hymn. So again, go back and look at the introduction to history, which is also uh, feeding two birds with one hand, because that material is also going to help you with the midterm review, and make some specific historical references. Now let me also say that I would like for you to make these historical ref references post first century AD. In other words, post-New Testament canon. Now, of course, the Bible takes priority in your worship designs, but we're assuming that your whole design and your reasons for your design are saturated in Scripture. That's just an assumption. Remember, the first foundation for, for uh, leading worship and designing worship is biblical, biblical foundations, and then theological foundations follows from that. So that's really assumed when you do these designs. But on the aesthetic design, we do want you to get into that third foundation of history. I will allow for, for you, because I, I mentioned some, some Second Temple issues, um, so if, if you wanted to connect to the Second Temple issues in terms of confession of sin that's brought up in the history of worship uh, review, that would be fine. But I'll tell you, if you want to include that in your, in your design, so for example, if you want to have a prayer of confession, I think that would be a great idea to include a prayer, prayer of confession. I tend to put that uh, toward uh, the beginning of the service. In the ancient liturgy, it's at the very beginning of the service. Uh, but that'd be a great idea to, in, to include your uh, confession of sin or a confessional part to your liturgy. Uh, if, if you did that, yes, that would connect, as, as I say in the, the, the history review material, it would connect to Second Temple Judaism. I, I like to root the confession of sin to Second Temple Judaism in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. But you also could connect it and, and get into post-100 uh, A.D. by going to the Kyrie, which arises out of the 5th century, again referenced in that history uh, review. So really what I do in the history review is show you that the Kyrie, uh, God have mercy upon us, that basic confession in the Roman church uh, actually has an earlier precedent, which is Second Temple Judaism and crying out to God, confessing, the people of God crying out to God, confessing their sins, admitting that their situation happened because of their collective sin. So uh, that's just an example of how you can make a historical reference. Feel free to use that one, uh, as, one as, as one of your three references. By the way, um, in the second video for this unit, I am going uh, to provide some examples of, uh, or one example of, of how we can design worship, and I'll have a confessional prayer time in that one, so you can see how that plays out as you watch the second video. Now, our next item here is worship order items. The order of the service is varied in a logical manner and reflects rich biblical and theological ideas and is presented with aesthetic worship in mind. Now, when I say the order of the service is varied in a logical manner, please make note of this. That is code for the worship is going to move from transcendence to eminence. I talk about that movement from transcendence to eminence in your mid 
midterm review. So again, we're making a connection here to this unit two material for the midterm. Transcendence and eminence. What do we mean by transcendence when we're talking about worship? Well, this is the big picture of who God is. Creator God, holy God, those big picture attributes, the omnis, the omnipotence of God, the omnipresence of God, that these ideas occur and are purposely presented toward the beginning of the service. Now, another way that you can present the big picture of who God is, his transcendence, is to have a very high Christology. Uh, you know, when you think about the New Testament, there are certain books of the New Testament, uh, although, of course, we see uh, the reality of a high Christology in all of the New Testament, in all of the Gospels, but if we look at the Gospel of John, for example, we see a very high Christology from the opening chapter. And then in Revelation, uh, which is a, another connection to John, uh, we see perhaps the highest Christology in all of Scripture. Uh, I believe that one of the reasons why the Western Church and the guidance of the Holy Spirit uh, had no issue in including Revelation, even though it was the latest of the New Testament canon in terms of the writing dates, they had no hesitancy including it in the New Testament canon, is because the Christology is so high, the, the, the concept of the Trinity is so clear. So you might have a high Christology as part of your transcendence. But again, these are big picture aspects. You're, you might be speaking to Christology, but you're talking about the aspect of how Christ is God. But as we move to the service, and, and really the bridge to eminence, I, I see is the confessional prayer time, and you'll see that later as I walk you through a, a worship order. Um, but your, your movement from transcendence to eminence will land you on the gospel. And why do I say that? Because when we say eminence, well, we're talking about closeness to God. Well, how is that possible? It, it, it's not possible just because one has a certain emotion. It's not possible just because there's a, a certain experience that one relates. It, it's possible because of the gospel. Only through... Uh, the life of Christ, which ultimately leads to his atoning death on the cross, uh, his burial, uh, his resurrection, which proves his divinity and proves that his work of redemption was complete on the cross. Uh, only through a recognition of this reality and surrendering one's life to the Lordship of Christ uh, do we actually experience eminence? And then we also celebrate, I, I will often include a, a, uh, in a prayer of confession the reality that Christ sits at the right hand of the Father, that he's intercessing on our behalf. So uh, we, we have this movement from transcendence to eminence. Uh, the bridge to that occurs through confessional prayer, and that's what we're talking about when we say the order is varied in a logical manner. Now, I would encourage you to do that. You're going to see uh, this similar wording for all the designs for worship order items. I would actually encourage you to do that progression on all of the designs to move from transcendence to eminence. You can do that for the blended and the kinesthetic designs as well. Now, valid argumentation, we've already talked about this on the, uh, on the uh, aesthetic observation that we, we want you to draw valid and reasonable conclusions. So this is just getting better and better at your graduate writing, making good arguments for why uh, you're presenting the worship design in the way that you're presenting it. Originality, evidence is exceptional original thinking. Now, the most obvious way to do this would be something I've presented already uh, in explaining this rubric. The most obvious way to do this is uh, going to be transferring the concept of aesthetic designs to a specific setting like a church plant setting in a city. That's the obvious way to make it original. And then you could get into details like the pictures from the city, as I mentioned, or perhaps multicultural music. Uh, in New Orleans, I, I actually think in some of the suburb areas like Metairie, um, going with a a contemporary approach might be most effective, like a, a passion uh, approach that would include some of the songwriting coming out of uh, the whole contemporary worship scene, like songs coming out of hill songs or elevation or passion. Now, of course, we've got to have strong 
theological filters in place because we, you know, we understand that some of these groups I just mentioned are, are uh, not Southern Baptists. Uh, Passion would have more of a connection uh, to, to, to Southern Baptists. So we're going to have to have theological filters, but certainly some settings, uh, particularly in the New Orleans suburbs, um, uh, Lakeview would be an area that's not quite metery, but has more of that feel where that kind of worship style would work better. But there's other areas of the city where really more of a multicultural approach, perhaps a black gospel approach, is going to be much more effective. And so you, you could do that. You could have an explanation as to why you're choosing the music that you're choosing for your service. Now, let's say that you're in that category of person who says, well, you know, I took your advice and I'd rather just do a really traditional aesthetic service. You know, let's have them in the robes and the uh, the stained glass and the pipe organ. And by the way, it, it seems that some of our younger generation, I'm noticing this with Z's, for example, uh, there seems to be a great interest in, in liturgy uh, and some of the high church liturgy. So it's fine to go that direction. So the way you would get your originality points is just having some details related to, to uh, some of those aesthetic particulars that could be traditional. So you can get these points either way. We're really giving you a lot of freedom there. And then in terms of grammar communication, once again, just 10% of the grade, all we're saying here is please proof this so there's not just obvious mistakes. But even there, the grade on both the observations and the designs is mainly, as you can see, about content. It's all about the content on these. Now, um, I'm going to look at at one other of our designs. I'm not going to walk all the way through it, but just to, mainly to show you how this top, top category of content design can change from rubric to rubric. So uh, we'll, we'll go back to uh, look at our kinesthetic design. That's a, that's a good one to show you an example of how that top category can be different. So I'm just going to the kinesthetic design and I'm clicking on the rubric for that one. And we see in the top category for the kinesthetic worship design, in addition to demonstrating competency in one's understanding of kinesthetic models, and that, yes, that's going to tend to be, uh, whether you're talking about observations or designs, that's going to tend to be more charismatic, more contemporary. Uh, we're assuming that people are more physically engaged in the worship, which in a contemporary Southern Baptist church, you know, might include hands being raised during worship. Uh, I would allow for, some people would argue that certain types of liturgy could be very kinesthetic. So, for example, there are certain types of evangelical uh, Anglican churches or Episcopal churches where folks come down for communion and they actually stand around a table collectively and take the Lord's Supper uh, as a family. Well, that's, and, and then they're very engaged in the hymn singing and, and kneeling for prayer and things. of. I mean, you could make an argument that that's kinesthetic. Once again, if you went that route, you might want to provide an explanation in the first paragraph so that the person grading your project knows that you understand what you're talking about. Uh, but for most of you, you're probably going to create more of a charismatic or more of a contemporary setting uh, for your kinesthetic model. Uh, we're just simply saying through the wording that you're, you're revealing an understanding of kinesthetic models as expounded in the textbook and lecture post. And then the student integrates that understanding with a detailed explanation of how worship activities should unfold in the service. For example, critical transitions in the service. Additionally, the student provides a brief biblical, theological, and or historical argument for kinesthetic worship. So only on the kinesthetic design are we asking you to explain how this, how the worship elements unfold? Only in the kinesthetic design are you explaining how are we going to get from, let's say, a prayer of invocation, if you even have that in this service, to the first song? Or how are we going to get from the last song to the preaching to make those transitions smooth? If you want to do some of that explanation in the other two designs, that's fine. But I would encourage you on the other designs to use your word count 
uh, to more robustly explain your service with theological, biblical, historical explanations, maybe even cultural or aesthetic explanations. It's only in the kinesthetic design where you're really giving us some specific information on how you're making that transition. But of course, you're still going to have plenty of space to also give us uh, explanations of why uh, you're choosing the elements that you're choosing, which will include sort of a big picture assessment of the student provides it with this last sentence. The student provides a brief biblical, theological, and or historical argument for kinesthetic worship. And then these other items are really the same as, as your other designs, so we're not going to walk through those again. Uh, again, hopefully these designs will be helpful to you. Uh, you've probably got enough information even now that you've sat through this video to go create a design or, or to do observations. But I will say uh, there are other videos uh, in the class that will help you, like the history videos, that will help you uh, grow deeper in your foundations, help you design worship, help you observe worship. But keep this in mind. Uh, after you turn in your, your first set of observation uh, and, and designs, which is going to be your kinesthetic observation, your, excuse me, it's going to be your aesthetic observation, your aesthetic design. Even after you turn in that first one, there's going to be something you see later in the class and you're going to think to yourself, wow, I really wish I had known this when I did my aesthetic design. Don't worry about that too much. Uh, of course, the idea of this class is we're simply introducing you to worship leadership. Our goal is that you journey for the rest of your life, growing in these five foundations, recognizing that only as you lay those foundations before the Lord, as yourself being the worship leader and your team, as you lay those before the Lord, He's going to allow incarnational worship uh, to grow and be healthy in your local worship setting.